Hi, everyone. Welcome again to Structure Series. This is Episode 8, Disruptive Creativity. Really glad you're here. It's great to see some folks in the chat already letting us know where you're from. Interactive live session, please, uh, you know, put your put your name in there, say hi, say where you're from, put your email, your a website. And uh, if you have any questions for the speakers during this, please put them in the Q&A. So you can pull up the chat and have that going on your right. And then the Q&A all the way to the right is where you're going to put actual questions. So uh, let's see. I want to say thank you to Karen Dunn and the KMD Pro team for running this event. I want to thank Dan Bones for our opening animation and Greg Brace for our original music score and all of you for showing up today and supporting Structure. Also, we have a Structure YouTube channel where all of these videos end up and you can watch them again and share them and um, you know, share them out with, with people and like them, subscribe. All the likes give us uh, more support so we know what kind of content you like to, to see. So. So first off, I want to thank our sponsor, Cordura Fabric. They have been a part of Structure since 2014. They've been a strong supporter of my vision for bringing the design community together and giving creators the opportunity to have a unified voice. Um, when I started Structure, my hope was to create a place where the design community can connect, get inspired and grow. And Cordura was super excited to join as a collaborative and a disruptive partner to help fulfill my vision. Uh, from the start, they were really hands-on, grassroots. Their support for the creative process was has been amazing. Um, they brought a lot of creative ideas, um, building direct and durable bonds with designers and other ingredient brands. Uh, plus, they've given myself and other designers from the Structure family the opportunity to create special Cordura capsule collections. Um, from extreme durability to their softer side of Cordura, they're disrupting and defining the future of performance fabrics. Thanks again, Cordura and team, for your support of Structure and the creative community. So today we're talking about disruptive creativity. And my two guests are... Um, two women that come from, one from the music industry, one from the design industry, our uh, creative director in uh, marketing, advertising, and um, you know, she's a visual artist. And they both have um, ways that they come in and disrupt the message, disrupt you know, what we're used to seeing on a, on a daily basis. And that's why I wanted to bring them here to talk about this topic. So I want to welcome Layla and Allison to the screen. Please join us. There's one. And there's two. Great. Welcome, you guys. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Okay. Test the microphone. So, and everyone is doing okay with all the disruptive weather and everything else that's been going on in the world. So, good. So, I want to start off, usually I start off kind of, um, well, I want to do a quick introduction so people can just hear very quickly your name, who you are, and what you're doing today. We'll talk more about where you come from, um, but Allison, why don't we start with you? Sounds good. So yes, my name is Allison Ross. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for having me. This is actually my second time doing structure, so um I think it was in 2015, the last time yes. that I spoke at one of the live conferences. So yep. um, very honored to be invited again for this kind of COVID video version of it. <laughs> right. um, I am a creative director, work primarily in branding, and as you said, some advertising as well, but mainly brand building uh, with a lot of CSR, like social impact at the core of it. I'm based out of Brooklyn, New York. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with Layla and okay. you. <laughs> Just Layla, not me. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm and a little starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's Layla. It's the Iron Maiden poster. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Layla. How about you? Tell us about you. Hi, I'm Layla Abdul Raouf. Uh, I'm aware of many, many hats. Um, mostly uh, a musician, composer, vocalist um administrator writer and educator 
and this is my first time uh, on Structure, uh, so thanks so much for having me. Um, Michelle, you and I, we've been in touch about this for, for some time, I think maybe yeah. since the beginning. So it's just yeah. exciting to see all of this come to fruition in a different context, yeah. um, you know, on Zoom and, you know, so many more people can take part. So it's really yeah. exciting. Yeah, we're being flexible these days, aren't we? <laughs> we're doing what we can to connect. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to in-person events again, but also what I love about the Zoom community is that we can reach people in places that can't always get there live, you know, in person. So you find, you find uh, further elements of your tribe. So um, I'm happy to do this as well. And we can be partially in our pajamas when we do it. So, um, so I want to start off instead of delving into backgrounds and who you guys are and where you come from, we're gonna talk about that in the context of, of the topic today. But I wanna start off with what does disruption mean to you? So, you know, just right out of the gate, Layla, why don't we start with you? What does that word mean to you? Uh, for me, um... It just sends a visceral message. It's all about viscerality for me. So you see something that doesn't quite match up with what your expectations are. And, um, and for me, I mean, I, we're going to talk about backgrounds later, but I feel like my life has been one disruption after another, right. um, whether, whether it's me doing the disrupting or the world or it happening to me. So, right. um, so it could be, it could be just something that's jarring. It could be like, just, uh, just a clashing of the opposites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Allison, yeah. you want to, you want to keep going? We can yeah. keep, uh, <laughs> yeah. this could go on all driving day. off each yep. other. Yeah. Absolutely. It's interesting. The idea of disruption and this idea of disruption and creativity, right? My job is to help other community other people communicate what it is they want to communicate and mm -hmm. i like doing it in a really disruptive way but at the same time i have to have their long-term goals in mind as well so you have to do it pretty carefully but when i think of disruption it's like a twist in the plot or it's a curveball or it's the train like almost coming off the rails, but it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Like for a moment, it's like, it just stops everyone to like pay attention, evaluate what's happening and then move forward. So mm -hmm. that's, it, it, again, especially when it comes to branding, I think that's how I kind of view it. Yeah. And it's super fun. <laughs> well, when I was thinking about creative disruption, cause I was thinking about a disruptive creativity, you know, I, when I when this whole, Ep uh, structure series is about creativity. So every episode is some form of topic around creativity, the creative process and creative minds. And I was thinking about disruption was something that kept popping up into my head, of course, since COVID, everything's been disrupted. So that's really the buzzword these days anyway. But, um, but I, wanted, I started to think like, what does creative disruption mean? What does disruptive creativity mean? I kind of jumped back and forth between the two titles. And then also dug into the fact that there's, you know, specific concepts of creative disruption. Um, and I went for disruptive creativity because I really wanted to focus on the creativity piece. But I was looking up even just the definitions from Merriam-Webster and, you know, dictionary.com and whatnot. And disruption was listed as the act or process of disrupting something, a break or interruption in the normal course or continuation of some activity or process. So it's just some sort of disruption. Then creativity, that definition is uh, one of the ones I loved was the use of the imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of artistic work. That was, re that was really resonated. Uh, you know, not all the creativity definitions really talked about artistic work. Um, so something that is disrupting, um, you know, through that original idea you know, through the, that creative work. And when I thought about the two of you, that was what was interesting to me is like, Layla, as you've said, like, like the work that, you know, you do that's disruptive just comes from you. It just comes from 
you know, where you've come from. It, it comes from within. I have a, a bit later on where we talk about kind of coming from within. And then Allison, you really use it as a very obvious means to do something. It's, you know, you're taking that and I'm going to disrupt this. Whereas out, you know, Leila, I don't think that you're coming at what you're doing as like, I'm doing this to disrupt things. You might, you know what I mean? But probably with lyrics, I was just thinking about that, how mm -hmm. um, like Vastum, my death metal band, uh, our lyrics are not the expected you know, mm -hmm. fantastical, you know, murderous, misogynist kind of thing that, you know, a lot of, a lot of what you would expect. Um, although they are violent, they're really mm -hmm. violent, violent, they're erotic. Uh, they're coming from different perspectives that aren't really voiced. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, uh, with my electronic trio, you know, the ethereal, the right. beautiful, the um, atmospheric, uh, trio that I have, Iona for, um, I'll write really, really brutal, violent lyrics for that and sing them in this just angelic voice. Um, so you, you think, yeah, it's sort of that juxtaposition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, whether people are really paying attention to it or not, I don't know, or care, but it's, it's fun to do. That's what I love about that stuff. Also, the hidden things. I mean, they're, they're there. They're not really hidden. But when you're listening to certain types of music, you're really you're listening for different reasons. And there's a discoverability in all of it. So I was digging into a bit of that here. So there's some dis there's a lot of discoverability in these layers of disruption. Like, you know, and Allison, the work that you do is like that as well, where, you know, you've thought layers deep into something that somebody is just seeing, you know, one time and getting a reaction to, and they're not really sure maybe why, right? Yeah, I, and you know, as we're speaking about this now, what came to my mind was like old school way of doing things and new school way of doing things. And eventually new school mm -hmm. becomes the old school and then it's new school. So it's this like constant progression right. forward. Right. And Layla, what you were just saying now about having like both this aggressive side and this ethereal side, like that's your, legacy throwing curveballs at what your legacy was you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. with with this yeah. other group of people which is really interesting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i want to take that what you just said and move into um usually we do our poll in the middle um but i want to start off with the poll because there was something i really wanted to dig into around these concepts as um, you know, because one of the things you just mentioned is one of the concepts that I was that I was digging up. Oops. What was that? Spoiler. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it was great. It leads us in. But when I was kind of just doing some research on, you know, disruption, just all of it is like there were some really top main concepts that are used both in the business, marketing, um, and you know, economics and whatnot of creative creative disruption creative destruction and uh, disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. And all three of them, uh, one of them is very old. The other two were developed really in the 90s, but they're used very clearly in these business models. And um, I want to talk about those, but first I want to put up a poll to just kind of get a sense of our audience. Here it is. We don't get to do it, but the audience does, and we get to talk about it, um, <laughs> is um, uh, just to see what these things are. Um, so audience, this is your time to, to check in and see what you think these are. Note that some are single choice and some are multiple choice. So you might, you know, you'll get thrown off a little bit by that. Um, so first one, what is creative disruption? What do you guys think that is? You get uh, disturbing our partner's sleep while we are in the process of creating. Using a highly creative message to break patterns of other people. Using music or other background noise to inspire creativity. So, you guys have any thoughts? This is really just the fun part. We'll talk more about it. And then creative destruction. When we destroy materials in order to create something beautiful. Destroying the old to create something revolutionary. And that's a key word in there. And then when my three-year-old gets creative around the house with crayons and markers, it's got to be that one, right? I don't have a three-year-old anymore. Okay. And then what is disruptive innovation? 
the most influential business idea of the early 21st century, because that's innovation is a more modern word that has been used more recently. Um, creates a new market, eventually displacing established ones or anything that is revolutionary. So go ahead and we'll, we'll let them finish up and then we'll see the results. Um, I don't know what, you know, what do you guys know about those concepts? How are you, were you aware of any of those before I brought them up? I mean, I figured Allison in your line of work probably, um, but Layla, you are, you dig into a lot of this type of stuff as well, but. Yeah, I didn't know anything about uh, disruptive innovation. I guess that's a business term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think creative destruction is an economic term. It's the older of the three. So that was developed in the 50s. Um, and disruptive innovation is the newest. Creative disruption was kind of just before it, I believe. I don't, I have my notes here, so. All right, are we still going on the poll? Karen, we'll keep that open until we feel like we've gotten a few responses there. Um, but I wanted to dig into these because I thought they were really interesting in terms of um, the distinction of them. So creative destruction is a 1950s, I think it's Joseph Schumpeter is his name. He was a political economist from Austria. Um, it came out of the work of Karl Marx that he that he brought that in. And it was the process, I, I found a, a, a process of industrial mutation that continuously revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one, which I, is a bit of what you were saying, Allison, too. Like all of these are that way of kind of breaking something down and building a new one. Um, so, that is a well-known one that um, I actually had some family kind of bring that up when I talked about disruption and they brought that up as well. I'm like, wow, people, people know about this one uh, from the older generations. Um, so Karen, I think we can shut down the poll and see some result there. All right. All right, looks like we've got pretty good. Yep, so on the first one, everyone got it, of course. And the second one, destroying materials in order to create something beautiful. Oh. <laughs> so I got some a vote on there. There's a few, few votes in here. Um, creating a new market, eventually displacing the old one, anything that is revolutionary. Actually, on number three, do you guys know? It's a multiple choice. It's the first one, right? It's the first one and the second one. So it was, yeah, it was it coined the, the most influential business idea of the 20, early 21st century. And it does create new market, eventually displacing old ones. But um, anything that is revolutionary, it's kind of a little bit of a trick way to say it too, because you were saying like um, with, with disruptive innovation, um, it, was, it was, how do we say it here? Um, not all innovations are disruptive, even if they're revolutionary. So one example that I thought was really interesting, and I, I cited some newer examples as well, but um, the first automobiles in the late 19th century were not a disruptive innovation because early automobiles were expensive luxury items that did not disrupt the market for the horse-drawn vehicle market. The market for transportation essentially remained intact until the debut of the lower-priced Ford Model T in 1908. The mass produced automobile was a disruptive innovation because it changed the transportation market, whereas the first 30 years of automobiles did not. And I thought that was an interesting thing to say, you know, like it, it how things disrupt and what they disrupt. You can just make something better. So, or you can actually do something that comes in and disrupts. And it's really about um, with the innovation, it's about disrupting at kind of entry level and lower price and lower levels that actually changes the market um, and, and lets people enter it. So um, anyway, so I wanted to kind of get into that and see, you know, what does, what is that like these different ways that disruption um, kind of comes in and changes things, you know, and how, you know, and Allison, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on this with the work that you do, because you focus on this. Yeah, definitely. The, the thing that pops into my mind, the idea of like destroying something that exists to create something more 
beautiful makes me feel really awful. It makes me think of, I will not mention a brand, but a pocket phone and internet access device that we all have <laughs> that looks like this. Um, you know, I would call that disruptive innovation. It's disrupting the environment. It's disrupting mm -hmm. resources. It's not taking into account the future. And I'm, I'm not trying to get all like sustainability on us right now, but I think there's for any disruption there, there are equal negative and positive mm -hmm. ones mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to make sure that we focus on the positive ones for positive change and like, try not to do the ones that are causing negative change. That that's what came to my mind with the disruptive innovation, which I know is again, not the old statement. It's like the one that was in the nineties, but it's like, I think that's dated. Like, yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Unintended disruption Yeah, is a, a bit of what we're having now or, or this idea too, of some of it's unintended and some of it is intended and we can't tell the difference in some of it. So especially if it's marketed stuff. really well and yeah. makes you love it, which is again, part of the work that people like yeah. myself do for good or do for money. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, let's dig into um, how you guys started doing what you do. So I want to start with some early years, early influences. And Layla, I want to start with yours um, and just see like, yeah, what were some of your early influences? What were your disrupt? What was the disruption like for you in the early years? <laughs> Whatever you well, want to share. Yeah. Um, so I have an Egyptian immigrant father and an Irish American mother. Um, so my and they they divorced when I was four years old. So um, my whole childhood was a constant disruption of going right. back and forth between their their homes. And each home was a completely different world. So I learned really quickly how to adjust to like just being thrown in the fire mm -hmm. in so many different situations, like, um, like, okay, now I'm spending, you know, <laughs> Easter lunch with my mom's family. And then I'm, I'm in a mosque with my father, like Friday wow. night. Wow. Um, yeah. and yeah. I, lived, I lived in Malaysia for one year as a child wow. and yeah. that, um, you know, completely thrown in the fire of a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was sink or swim. It was like survive or, or, or just wither away. And yeah. so, um, but music, yeah, music was always there for me. You know, mm -hmm. my, my, everyone in my family has uh, a considerable amount of talent there. Um, even if, even if it wasn't fully tapped or realized, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, the traditional way, but. Um, Did your parents do music? Well, no. my mother, not, well, yes and no. It was like, they never like professionally went into music or, mm -hmm. or tried to have a, some kind of, you know, side career where they, they, you know, write music or perform it. But my mother did have like a singing group back in the early sixties. Like that was oh, part yeah. of her, in her Catholic high school. And they would like, they would perform it. They would, they would actually perform on street corners oh. in, in, um, I think it was the Bronx or Brooklyn. I can't remember. Mm. Um, so that was like, I mean, I just, when, every time she tells me those stories, I'm just so, I just, I feel like I'm there and I'm hearing it, like all the sounds mm. in the city and everything. Oh, cool. Cool. And my father, I mean, he, he owned a grand piano. Right. And so I would like sit and play on that thing and teach myself. Mm -hmm. I took like two piano lessons when I was six and I was like, that's it. I, I, I know that I don't want to learn piano in the classical way. Like I want to huh. teach myself and make it my own fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, what made you say that? I mean, like, I always wonder about that because I had that same thing playing my grandfather's one, but what made you decide, like, I don't want to do it in the classical sense. I want to teach myself. Like, 
do my own thing. You know, oh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we could get really psychoanalytic and be like, well, you know, yeah. I was trying to just eliminate, you know, the father figure from everything. <laughs> uh, remove the authority figure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe yeah. I just knew it unconsciously then, but yeah. then it got more and more conscious as time went on. I, yeah. I, I learned the trumpet when I was 11 because I was bored of playing the flute and wanted to be noticed. And I wanted to be loud. And I wanted to do all the things that, that none of the girls in my school were doing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, much to the, you know, <laughs> chagrin of my parents <laughs> who had to deal with hearing me practice in the early days. I'm sure that was pretty miserable for them. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but then I was classically trained on the trumpet you know, I did jazz, classical, yeah, you know, marching band, all that stuff. And then, and then when I was 13, I was like, I, I'm going to pick up the guitar and I'm going to teach myself. No one, I'm not even going to take a single lesson and I'm going to buy some songbooks and just wow. make it my thing. And that, that's, you know, and I, I, I'm a twin, right? I have a twin okay. sister. Mm -hmm. And when you're a twin, it's so hard to make your own identity that's separate from your, from your sibling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that's that sort of desire fueled um, why I wanted to make it my own thing and not have anyone tell me what to do. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. You know, that, 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 that need to be heard is something I hear often you know, in, in some of these kind of fields where, you know, it's, it's both this, like, for me, it was like that hiding, but also needing to be heard, you know, and um, trying to find some way to kind of dig through and, um, you know, get some attention in some way um, without getting the other kind of attention you don't want, you know? So yeah. that I can get psycho psychoanalytical about all this as well, but I'm probably not as good as you, but I love to dig into these reasons, like where we come from. That's why I love talking with people in the creative process about where we come from, because it says a lot about where we've gone, where we end up and, and what has formed us, you know? So um, how about you, Allison? I know a little bit about your background as well, but let's hear, hear it from you. Hear it. Yeah. Early years, definitely. Uh, I was very lucky to grow up in a very artistic and musical family. My father was a very talented pianist. Um, my brother played piano as well. My mother, a really talented oil painter. Mm -hmm. So from a very <clears throat> young age, music and art was just, that was like our thing. Uh, when I was 13, I wanted to play drums. My parents thought that would be far too disruptive for our household <laughs> in Montreal. Uh, so instead I picked up the guitar, same as you, Layla. I was like, I don't want lessons. I want to do this my way. I want to play the songs I want to play, that kind of thing. I'm bummed you didn't do the drums though. I know, me too. Like, come on, next, next chapter. <laughs> this will be my inspiration to do it. But yeah, so definitely music and art, a huge part of it. Before I even knew I wanted to go into graphic design, like I wanted to make bands purely to make merch and like posters for like sh shitty gigs and things like that. Making mixtapes with, you know, getting way too in the details. So yeah. I know that we'll talk about our education a little bit later, but I think my parents noticed very early on like oh she should be a graphic designer and I didn't even know what that was so I'm thankful because I feel like I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are in this industry and they always say my parents have no idea what I do and it's like my parents right. knew what I was going to do before I knew I was mm. going to do it so I feel very grateful for yeah for that. and I would say those are my biggest like early early influence those are always those things like like when you don't know what's out there to do you know yeah. and it, to me I always feel like for parents it's like it's the exposure you know exposing people to the to the options and the ideas I had I had a bit with that as well where I was making 
I was doing a lot of graphic design, kind of making all my own clothes and like making band uh, tapes and whatnot and posters. And, and, and um, I unfortunately never picked up the instrument early on. I was, I was singing, but my parents were both musicians. My dad played in a rock band and whatnot. And so there was some level of it always being kind of kept from me. And every, every guy I dated was a musician, every, you know, every, you know, I had, I was around it all the time. Um, but, um, I didn't pick up the instrument. And so, and I think it's interesting about, you know, that age 12, 13, 14 seems to be that time that most people do that if they hadn't started earlier. Yeah. So I'm going to play the drums. You're going to pick up whatever instrument you want. Layla will. will Layla's going to play everything. <laughs> yeah. Layla's going to make up for our like <laughs> terrible talent and it'll be great. She's going to play the trumpet. I was just I'll learn graphic design. <laughs> That's actually something I've always wanted to get good at and I'm terrible at. So. Never too late. It's super yeah. easy. <laughs> it's super easy. All right. Well, let's go into education. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I love I love this part too because like Layla, I, I actually you know for as many times as we've talked about things, I didn't know all of your education. Even though we've talked about it, it doesn't always resonate because there's so much, so many layers that you have. It's hard to keep it all yeah. um, there. But you have a master's in audiology and speech sciences. And then when I heard this, you know, like psycholinguistics, child language research, I was like, wow, what is that? Because I was very, uh, I studied anthropology and linguistics was just a side note. And I was very, oh, I didn't interested. know that. That's really cool. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So tell me. Well, kind of like um, sort of piggybacking off of what Allison and you were saying about parents. It's like my parents knew I had this, this uh, musical ear, mm. like really, really young in life, but like a lot of parents, especially back in those days, you need something to fall back on. Like you can't right. just be right. a musician. So, right. so um, like, don't even think about not going to college because you're going to college. Um, and, you know, there you are, uh, not even 18 years old being like, well, what am I going to do when I get there? Um, I just want to <laughs> play in bands. I mean, I was playing mm -hmm. at CBGBs when I was like a teenager. So <sighs> the, you know, my band opened for, for that shred guitarist, the, the great cat. Um, oh, when was that? Oh the God. 80s? Nin no. Um, 90s? 90. That would be 90s. Yeah. Something like that. Um, mm -hmm. anyway, so it was like, yeah, it was like, well, everyone, it's like everyone around me was going to college. So, uh, but what do I do? I don't, I mean, I just went just kind of took classes not knowing what to take and then psychology resonated with me um and then i made a friend who uh was a linguistics major and introduced me to that field and i took a class and i really loved it um and and then i don't know what i got myself into after that <laughs> Um, well, I, I, double, I double majored in both, and then hmm. I, I minor. I did minor in music theory and composition. So, so I still have that really firm theory background, but, but the psychology and the linguistics uh, sort of um, in my undergrad work sort of like morphed into the speech pathology work because where hmm. I went to school didn't have that degree. Mm -hmm. So I applied for grad program in speech pathology, which combined um, all that psycholinguistics, uh, mm -hmm. it combines um, acoustic studies, which for musician is really yeah. fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, analyzing spectrograms of speech, like knowing how to read formants and fundamental frequencies and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Anatomy of the speech mechanism, which... Right. We've uh, talked about yeah <laughs> yeah Michelle and I've talked about quite a bit as yeah. a as a vocal coach so yeah, yeah. that's um the all it, it's such an amazing field because it's so interdisciplinary mm -hmm. and so even though um I didn't decide to pursue that as a as a long-term career that knowledge went a long way in my you know, in my life, in all different yeah. ways, music, communication, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Communicating with people who, who um, have brain injuries, who stutter, mm -hmm. who have hearing loss. You know, I mm -hmm. sort of developed this compassion and knowledge of how to interact with oh, just the widest spectrum of people possible of all ages, races, backgrounds, yeah in a yeah. hospital or in a school and all of that. So, yep. and then one day I was like, I can't, I can't imagine myself doing this for the rest of my life. Um, I, I uh, worked as interns at, in, as an intern in two different settings. And I was just so burnt out at the end of each day. I literally would go crawl into bed and fall asleep and wake up the next morning and do it all over again with no time for anything else. Yeah. I knew something was wrong at that point, that, that, that um, I needed to disrupt my, <laughs> my life, uh, yeah. which was, you know, at that point in time, a really difficult decision to make. It was completely yeah. throwing everything out the window that was handed to me or that I earned through yeah. My studies, so yeah, it was um, it was a very very difficult decision, but one that I never regret. And yeah. here I am. And you went all the way through a master's degree. I mean, that's a lot of study and beyond. I did begin and a beyond. PhD. I did wow. begin a PhD, and I um, realized how much I hated writing academic papers. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, right. You channel it into other work. Like I was going to ask, how did that come into your creative work then? You know, because to me, it clearly does. You know? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, in, in an abstract sense, the stuff I was learning definitely feeds into my creative work. But, you know, the day to day stuff, not really, not so much, mm -hmm. um, because my creative life was always there. It was always parallel yeah. to the grad studies. Yeah. yeah, I was in this, you know, touring hardcore band the entire time I was in grad school, you know, playing in, you yeah. know, stinky basements and sleeping on floors for, <laughs> you know, weeks to months on end. Wow. That's quite a juxtaposition too, you know, going from one to the other. Like, so yeah, Allison, I was going to say like, one of the things like, um, I did some vocal coaching with Layla for extreme metal vocals. And, um, that was like that, that piece where she talks about like the, the physiology you know, of how to use the voice. And that's what it like, for me, I really got into that, that place of, of how to do it right, but also the sounds you can make, mm -hmm. the different things that you can do um, with the shape of the body, because also being a martial artist, that was something that I had studied for 30 years is, is how to use the body leverage and energy and whatnot. So it just tied right in. And it felt like kind of martial arts for the voice in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, um, I just, I didn't know there was a degree for aud like what audiology really was. So I thought that was, you know, really, really fascinating. Um, just to be clear, I'm not an audiologist. Like the degree is called audiology and speech science. It's actually called different things at different universities. Hmm. Like, okay. like Allison, I think at McGill, it might be called like communication disorders or something. I don't yeah. know. There's like <gasps> different things. So I took a couple of audiology classes, but my focus was, speech and child language okay. research. Yeah. Mm. Why child language? I just have to ask that. <laughs> oh, um, the language development is so fascinating. Okay. Um, if you, if you've read about any of it, how yeah. you're basically, you're, you're born as like this blank slate and then you could be dropped in any country as an infant and be a native speaker of any language mm -hmm. you live in. What's, neurologically happening there and um and how is it that when you're like four years old you're a master in whatever language mm -hmm. you're learning mm -hmm. yeah. so uh like what's going on and, and then so all these stages between you know zero to four is a huge yeah. uh developmental curve and yeah. and they're really really distinct Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it, it, and then when you're studying, like I just sort, I studied different, uh, you know, language impaired populations where that, that um, language development is, is disrupted, you know, mm -hmm. by either something 
uh, neurological or, yeah. or it's, you know, or it's um, related to uh, central auditory processing. Mm -hmm. there, there's, it's like, there's so many different factors involved with what can cause a language impairment. Um, so it was, you know, I, I was just fascinated. It was really sort of like a passion in yeah. terms of a uh, field of study. Yeah, yeah. Well, Allison, why don't you piggyback off of that into yeah. what you what you uh, studied and um, yeah. I yeah. See yeah, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say, Layla, what you were saying about by the age of four, you like, all right, I am fluent in whatever place I'm yeah. at. I grew up in Montreal, right? So it's within Canada, which is primarily English. And then Quebec, though, is primarily French. And my mother was French. My father was English. At home, we spoke mostly in English, but then all of my elementary school was in French. And I remember the moment I was in the first grade, like hated kindergarten, hated for grade one because I just didn't know what was happening. And then something clicked and I was fluent for a first grader in French. Like I could, I could navigate. Um, but fast forward, uh, so in school and college and university in Montreal or in Quebec is a little bit different. So you, you only go up to grade 11 in high school mm -hmm. and then typically do a college degree. So I went to Dawson College, which is in Westmount, Montreal. They have an excellent design program. I was the first year that was like, whoa, curriculum's changing. We're going to use computers now. This is oh, how yeah. long ago it was. Yep. 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 So it was, you know, three years of just learning how to think up ideas, put them on the computer, working with the old school Swiss typographer teachers that had been there forever, like learning the roots and foundations of graphic design, which was fantastic. And then after my three years there, I decided, okay, you know, I was going to get a job to be able to support myself and then go back to school to UCAM, which is a French university. So Dawson's an English university at uh, college and UCAM is a French university, which, um, like your childhood, <laughs> I like my childhood. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it was, it was tough. It was really tough, but I got through it. Uh, the, the benefits of going to UCAM was, while Dawson was a lot hands-on the computer, we had to learn the tools. UCAM was like primarily conceptual thinking. That's where I learned to think of bigger stories, to, things that are more than, than just, you know, making it look and be designed properly, like mm -hmm. for it to have a little bit more substance to the style of it, I suppose. And I, I, would not be where I am now without having both of those experiences. So mm -hmm. that's basically, yeah, my, my education. And funny to say, Dawson, the first year I applied, I did not get in to graphic design. So I did fine art for a year to, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is so funny. Yeah. It's just funny to, to look back and be like, oh, like mm -hmm. I wasn't good enough to get in, but then I got in and then Kind of uh, from that point on, worked my work ethic completely changed and decided I'm going to work my ass off at things and make shit mm -hmm. happen. So I was going to ask you, like, what did that do to you to not get in? I, I picture like, why did you not get into a graphic design program? Because uh, you know? uh, let's be honest, I was a shithead in high school. I was a class clown. I was the all of my teachers probably hate me <laughs> and no I was I was definitely uh, a little rebellious troublemaker mm. so I don't think I went into it as serious as some of the other people who went into it mm. and that seriousness just increased every year that I studied it got mm. like for and university I took very very seriously yeah. I was and again I was working full-time at the time at like a pharmaceutical company doing marketing and packaging and while you were in school mm -hmm. while I was in school yeah, yeah and yeah. yeah for about for three years I had no life I just went to 
to work. And then I went to school and I mm. worked my tail off and yeah. That, that was worked. my experience. That was my entire <laughs> grad school experience. <laughs> yeah. And, but it's, I think it's a good thing to experience just, and I know like this whole world is all about like making time for work and life balance, et cetera. Mm. But at mm. that moment, you know, I, I knew I wanted to like build a solid foundation for myself. And I worked very, very, very hard to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I can relate to um, the, the not getting accepted part for, but I had the opposite. <laughs> I had the opposite thing. And I actually, um, I didn't have parents who were like, you're going to college. They were a little bit the opposite. I actually had to kind of work my way into college on my own, but I started applying to colleges um, as an artist in my junior year of high school. And I applied to, I went down to the San Francisco Art Institute. We were up North and they would do portfolio day. And I got accepted in that first year, my junior year for their fine arts program. But of course I'm not going to go. I still have high school to finish. So I went down my senior year with a new portfolio and they rejected me. They <laughs> said, you're too illustrative and graphic. You should be an illustrator or a graphic artist, but we're trying to up our fine arts game. And they, they rejected me. And, um, and that was a pivotal point because I was actually working for a graphic artist at that point and starting to get a certificate in that field, but I didn't pursue that field at all. So I have the opposite experience, <laughs> you know, but that feeling of, oh, fine, you know, like you're just like, I'm gonna show you in some way, but um, it didn't manifest the same for me. <laughs> So then, you know, out of school, it's like, so Layla, you didn't go into your field, but you're working right. around it anyway. I mean, talk about, um, because to me, it's like, I know you have a job that you love because you're around this thing, but you, this type of, 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 um, of field, but you also poured so much into then um, your artistic work you know, playing in your musical work, your creative work. So will you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of those two together, you know, what you did after school? I mean, you were already doing your creative work while you were in school. Yeah. Yeah. So. Their creative work never stopped. I mean, it stopped a little bit in college because I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to hunker down and, you know, find out what I find out what I want to be. Right. You know, I, I bought into that for a little while. <laughs> very, very short while. Um, but, you know, when I made that difficult decision to leave the PhD program at Purdue, um, I, I, I took, technically I took a year sabbatical and I, 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 I moved out of my apartment and lived out of my car for about a year and a half. Wow. Um, and Montreal was one of the places I had a pit stop for a few months <laughs> or would kind of go back and forth from there. So I was kind of bouncing back and forth between New Jersey, Montreal, Ohio. Um, I was in a band at the time that were based in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I had friends in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I would stay out there for a little while, uh, Kansas City. So it's like every, in all of these places, I had different creative projects very different styles of music. Um, and, and I just, I, I was so, I felt like a caged animal. I felt like, okay, from, from like kindergarten through <laughs> age 26 or whenever that was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, everything was like laid out for me, you yeah. know, high school, college, uh, grad school like every it's like everything everything was planned out and I and I just I didn't feel like I was really living so I just um mm. spent that year it was actually a very difficult year it wasn't it, emotionally it was it was quite traumatic you know I, I went through yeah. I lost a lot of friends and I had very traumatic breakup and all of that um so that but it's like I needed that experience to be like okay where like I'm in charge of myself. I need to, I need yeah. to ground myself somewhere. No one's going to do it for me. Mm -hmm. It's been, people have been doing it for me my whole life. Yeah. I'm going to decide. So that is when I uh, moved out to the Bay area in the early aughts and 
happened to um, hook up with a um, college friend of mine who wanted to start a band with me. And so that's, and I was like, well, all right, I, I haven't worked in like a year. I have no money. Um, I sold my car so I could pay off some of my college loans. Um, and, and it was like, and he was like, oh, don't worry. Like I have this cheap room you can rent in my apartment, like $200 a month. So it's like, if that hadn't happened, I might not have ended up out here, at least not then. And, and I, and it was like, when I came here, everything fell into place. Uh, well, everything music, you know, musically fell into place. The, the job stuff and the apartment stuff sort of came a little later, but, mm. but when it, when, when I moved here and I met a drummer who 18 years later, I'm still making music with, mm -hmm. I knew that, that this was the right place. This was the right time to be here. Um, yeah. and it just, everything just sort of caught on, um, mm -hmm. every, every, all the other place pieces of my life fell into place. There was a scene here, right? I mean, there was a lot going on here through the, yeah. you know, musically there always kind of has been, um, but it's shifted. And there was a scene uh, that was going on that you found yourself in, right? Yeah, um, especially at that time, San Francisco was still semi-affordable. Mm -hmm. Like you could work part-time and have, you know, still have like a bunch of roommates and be able to get by mm -hmm. um, without being in any sort of serious debt. Now you can't, I mean, even with roommates, you can't do that. You need, yeah. everybody needs to work their butt off to, to live in the Bay area. But, right, right. but at the time it was like, you know, I got into admin work because the, the admin lifestyle is nine to five, or, you know, there are all these opportunities for part-time work. A lot of the jobs back then had full benefits, mm -hmm. even, even though the pay rate wasn't that great. I was getting like free, like healthcare, uh, acupuncture, like every kind good of good healthcare. Yeah. yeah good yeah, healthcare. Yeah. Holistic. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I was right. living pretty well, even though I had, you know, a bunch of roommates and stuff. Um, but that changed, you know, that, that was, um, you know, probably towards the late aughts 2010 around that, that's when it really just, there was this palpable shift in the Bay area where it was just like, I mean, rents were just skyrocketing. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. like, like normal people couldn't live here anymore. And then that right. around then I felt like was, you know, Oakland always had its separate music scene mm -hmm. from San Francisco, but it seemed like at that point, like everybody started moving to the East Bay and, yeah. um, and that's where all the artists live. Mm -hmm. um, even though Oakland's very barely affordable these days. Right, anyway. right. It's like the New York to Brooklyn thing. And then Brooklyn yeah. becomes the, the, the place to be. Oakland's kind of the cool place to be. I think fourth most expensive city in the U.S. right now. So right. is San Francisco is number one. But yeah. Um, how about you, Allison? Like, where did you, I mean, you went right into JDK for a long time. I so did. you kind of launched off right into your career yeah I think when especially when I went into university I was like you are doing this to not work at this pharmaceutical company forever therefore worked very hard during my last semester at UCAM right before graduating I applied to JDK they offered me a job just like in March and I was like mm, sorry I'm finished school in June and they were, thank goodness, they're like, okay, cool, we'll just wait for you. And a bit of not just wait for me, they're like, okay, we'll come as soon as you can. Right, right. And uh, what was really special, a, an amazing opportunity at JDK is it, to me, it felt like an Andy Warhol factory in Burlington, Vermont, like in the strangest place, it, it was founded by um, Michael Jagger, who very early in his career partnered with Jake Carpenter from Burton Snowboards and okay. together, mm -hmm. you know, he helped 
build the brand with Jake to make snowboarding a thing, to make counterculture a thing. It became a studio that attracted clients that were going after that counterculture kind yeah. of feel. I remember, you know, kicking off projects with, you know, brands like Lululemon and they would come in and be like, do to us what you did to Burton in our, in a way that's authentic to Lululemon. But, mm -hmm. you know, for a, a good amount of time, people would come to JDK for that disruption. Right. Uh, and during my time there, worked with incredible people from all over like this place was a little crazy gem hive that attracted people from all over the world and I have while I was there I you know made or got a few mentors who are still my mentors to this day incredibly grateful for my time at JDK and yeah I was there for nine years right so yeah. right out of school and you know I, I grew up there yeah and kind of took all the good from that place with me into my next adventures so the last two years that I was at JDK I was actually in our Portland Oregon studio which was really cool oh, okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, it kind of helped, you know, I was a design director there and, you know, working on all our West Coast clients with an amazing team and like, again, more lifelong friends. But the thing about JDK and anyone who's a part of that network, it goes so far and so wide. There's just a, like an eternal connection that comes with that place, which is so mm. special and unique. And who knows if that'll ever exist anywhere yeah. else but yeah after JDK I went to the clothing brand now which Michelle is how you and I kind of met yeah. each other like I had this opportunity after spending nine years helping brands do whoa wild disruptive stuff and you know sometimes it sticks and sometimes oh you see it like slowly gets whittled down or watered down yeah. so totally. this opportunity to go be the head at a brand where oh let's do this crazy thing who needs to approve it oh yeah me okay approved like mm -hmm. it, it was mm -hmm. a pretty mm -hmm. fun experience so I was there for two years which was like eight seasons like I, like the whole clothing brand seasons are like right. absolutely insane but and this is a this is a disruptive brand I mean uh, you, it's a it's NAU which you know the way they spell it it you it looks the same upside down and whatnot and everything about it because I came into the whole world of apparel design too when when now was starting to really pop up yeah and um, it was about taking perform. It was one of the first brands to take performance and do streetwear, you know, and do dark colors and do just all muted tones and do really modern asymmetrical, all the disruptive stuff that you couldn't do in, you know, kind of a performance design and, you know, and sell it in a unique way and sell it in a sustainable way and use sustainable dyes. And I mean, I, I'm talking for you, but it was just like everything about that brand, every little piece was a disruptor, right? Abs yeah, absolutely. Like the swimming that, upstream. Yeah, for years. And yeah. the, uh, the thing that attracted me to that was, you know, after spending years doing cool, amazing culture shifting things, there was an element about now because it was sustainability, like sustainably sourced and produced forward. They were all about giving back to the planet. And there was this opportunity to join the team as the creative director and kind of reposition the brand, which we did to be like sustainability come standard. Like that was our like big high mission future, what the world should be like, where sustainability is a standard, hmm. which seemed crazy at the time and not sexy at the time. But right. today is like, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you don't have that, you're old school. Like it's yeah. not, it's not yeah. going to work. Yeah. But yeah, so that was, I'm, I'm going to just blast through my, my history for you, but the, you know, spent two years there, which was incredible. And again, made lifelong friends there as well mm -hmm. and had the opportunity to come to New York city 
to do something that was in between the two. It was a design studio, so meaning I could work with lots of different brands any given day, but was rooted in sustainability and social mm. impact. So I came to uh, Brooklyn, New York and Dumbo, BBMG, social impact studio. In, like Even now, I still uh, keep up with them and do mm. some projects with them. But yeah, I spent four years there as head of creative uh, and I feel like some of the work that I was able to do there, the one that stands out like the most disruptive, right? It's not a Nike campaign or anything like that. It was working with Gabby Giffords to help her build the gun violence prevention brand and platform called Giffords that purposely does not say guns are bad. It's that the, the, the guns in the hands of bad people is what's bad and and why I'm bringing this up is it's not like a complete leftist point of view it's really trying to we're not going to be leftist because if we're going to alienate half of the population we will fail we need to figure out how to speak to both sides that was her approach and she's you know the victim of an assassination attempt and she was like no but this is how we have to do it Mm. and I remember our round one presentation, we were in DC for it. And probably about 20 minutes before going in to present like, hey, here's the three ways, you know, the brand could come to life. There was a a mass shooting five miles away from where we, from the offices of Republican and Democrat Congress people doing a practice exhibition game for some baseball game that they were going to do. And some shooter just came in and, wow. and was yeah. like, hmm. So to have your meeting pushed because of the problem right. in society that you're trying to solve for, you present one direction. They're like, we got to go talk to CNN. Just hold on. We'll come back. And we're like, wow. oh my God. So that, that was kind of the, that was early while at BBMG and, and I was like, all right, graphic, you know, branding and design, you can, you can do some pretty important shit for the world. And I think since then that kind of became where my heart is, so. Well, with the, I mean, that's another, the, the, the thing about that one is for both of you guys, it's like when you're working with controversial or disruptive topics or ideas that really make a difference in the world you put yourself right up in the shit like right up at the edge of things and you get to you experience things that you know can can turn you away from it or pull you further into it right so um i think that's the the disruption as well it's like um it's it happens whether we want it to or not, but when we work in it specifically, um, we're, we're putting ourselves at risk of all kinds of things, you know, alienation, all, um, ridicule, uh, you know, that, but also these dangerous things and to, to move forward in it. That's, that's something that I see in both of your work, you know, you're right on the edge. Um, and wanted to kind of take that into, you know, I wanted to talk about like you taking your, your work into, solo work as well but I also want to move into um kind of how do I want to form the question of of um what does that what does that mean to you to do that because it feels like really important work to both of you that this is a passion you know whether it's in your music or working with people who are right on that edge or getting that message out to change the world like it feels like it's extremely important. Like it, it's just what you're both going to do. Empathy. Like ultimate, ultimate empathy for why, for, personally, for why these brands are trying to do what they do for the people who will receive that communication, what they think today, what they could think tomorrow, what are things that for both sides are like true, well, sorry, that's human truths and tapping into those. And um, yeah, and uh, encouraging people to be bold and brave for me. 
How about you, Layla? Like uh, growth, growth in in um, you know psychological, emotional, spiritual growth. I mean, what answer this question? Can there ever be true change without disruption? But, or, or at least not. change on a wide scale. There has, mm -hmm. Something has to be disrupted for things to change. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you think about it that way, thing, things have to keep changing because the world keeps changing. Um, sometimes it's just happening and it's out of our control. Um, and sometimes there are people putting themselves on the line mm -hmm. and their work isn't they're not really getting credit for what happens after when it becomes whatever they were working on becomes the status quo. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, True. you know, obviously in fields like design or like politics or something where you're, you're really reaching the masses that that can happen on a level. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not famous. Um, my work is happening on a really underground level. Uh, you know, even, even the most popular of my projects are reaching like this very fringe part of society. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think they're, they're expecting that, that amount of disruption or they're, or they're, they're able to handle it because that's the world they're in, but mm -hmm. whether I ever reach beyond that remains to be seen and it may never, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe it will, but <laughs> yeah. Look at every artist whose entire career was spent quietly and then blah, in hindsight, you know, or right. posthumously cult, or, you know, yeah. Or, or cult, cult movies as well. Like something that came out that, you know, it was too soon for its time or like didn't right. connect. And then all of a sudden, what a new generation's like, yeah, that's the shit. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, that leads me into like, you know, how do you choose the message you want to get across? You know, um, especially as solo artists or solo and independent now that you're running your own business, Alice, and your own um, group and, and Layla, you do both band work, but you do solo work. Um, how do you choose your message? How do you choose and how you craft it? You know, how do you choose what's important to you to get out there? Oh, it, for me, it's all subconsciously driven. Um, how I get the message out there, you know, finding finding the right cover image for an album mm -hmm. or title mm -hmm. or, you know, or, or, you know, like when you release an album and uh, you're working on your PR stuff, they want an artist statement. That's that's a really great way to just literally, you know, in black and white, get the message out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, whether what topic I want it to be, I, I don't, I don't plan it in advance it, because if I plan it too far in advance, it doesn't feel authentic to me mm -hmm. or I don't know. It, I got to be in the moment to know what it is. And to know what it is could happen in a dream. It could happen on the, in the liminal space between wake and sleep. I, that's where I like to yeah. come up with a lot of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, isolating myself so that I'm just, I can, my, my whole spirit will just take over the room without interruption. Mm. Um, I don't know. I guess that's the real answer. Do you choose images for because you, you could, for your music um, with an intent behind it, or does that come out of that as well? Like, does it evolve out of it, or do you have something where you're 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 you have an idea that I want to convey this or convey that? It can happen in any direction, or does it come out of the music? All of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. Um, it's happened in different ways. Uh, for each of the four albums I released under my name, uh, like for the, the, the one that just came out, Fantasiae, that's, that started with an image. Hmm. I knew okay. what I wanted the cover. I knew what I wanted the title 
to be, it's, um, I, I, you know, I forgot how I even came across the term. I think it was through uh, maybe compiling some academic readers at, at my job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I kind of looked it up and it, I really connected with that concept of the space between sensation and thought. Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, that that's, that's my creativity. That's, that's where my creativity exists right. in that space. So right. So I was like, oh, that would be, and I hadn't written a note of music at that point. So I, I had that concept and then I had the image to go along with the concept. Yeah. And then uh, the process was how do I write the album that fits that image and concept, which was so much, you know, so opposite to how I'd been doing it before. It was either the artwork came after it was an afterthought or, yeah. or, you know, I had to kind of force the, the cohesion to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized I don't want to force cohesion. I want, I want the cohesion to happen how it happens. Um, and I want to be in charge of it the whole time. I don't, I don't, mm. I don't want to compromise. I don't want to water it down with something that that's not going to fit or yeah. not feel genuine. Yeah. Those are conversations I feel like I'm having a lot these days, both with myself and the people around me and the other creatives that I talk about, especially through COVID, where people have really questioned what they were doing um, and done a reshift or, re, you know, and really digging in, you know, what do I, what are, you know, remaining or, or becoming true to yourself? Because I think we have not been, you know, like you said, like life laid out for us. A lot of that has been, whether or not it was laid out for us specifically culturally, we've had, you know, a prescriptive life laid out of what you should do. And that's being thrown into question in a big way. Um, so that authenticity, that word authenticity gets thrown around a lot in the, you know, business world as well, as people wrestle with that. But that's really what this you're talking about, too, is being authentically, authentically yourself, you know, and, um, and constantly having to check back in and go, this is mine. I don't want anybody to take this from me. I've been thinking about that a lot. So um, how about you, Allison? Yeah, when it's interesting when you say uh, solo work, I, I do not work solo. I bring people in to work with me who are so much smarter than I am and make me look fantastic all the time. So first of all, that it's more like an, uh, yeah, just a, a, again, new school consulting approach is what I'm trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, for Layla, again, for your creativity to come subconscious, like my approach has been the opposite. It has been so conscious. It's been, yeah. there was advice again, that a mentor of mine gave to me that he received from, from a friend of his, I believe that was building your own thing is an opportunity to take all of the amazing things you've experienced along the way and scrap out all the ones that were like, maybe not so good along the way and build something that is just the good shit. Uh, so that's kind of the approach that I've tried to take, whether it's the type of clients, the type of people I work with, the type of work I do, the expectation, like I operate best when, when I'm, you know, uh, yeah, bold and disruptive. And I have people that come to me specifically for that. And those that aren't interested in that, I know they won't have a good time. I won't have a good time. So you know, mm. pass, pass them on to someone that would be a better match for them as well. Like you're always using the expose flash. Uh, always. <laughs> That's your always. moment. Yeah. But that I exposure, wish... exposing yourself. You know, yeah. This just, is who I am. To, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't want to, uh, to fake being like more businessy or more professional than I am because you're not going to get that the entire time. I'm going to slip up and yeah. swear and it's going to be awful. And whatever. But I must also say for going, you know, kind of going on my own new path with 
amazing people working with me as well. That wasn't something that I was very comfortable about doing. I did this in early 2020 and I was very scared and very nervous to do it. And it really, you know, there's on, I can count on less than one hand, there are five people that really shared their experience of doing it gave me the confidence. These are people that I respect so much. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, the moment that I kind of publicly said it to everyone, the amount of support that I received was just so, um, yeah, so amazing and has kept me going. And yeah, I, I love that I was trying to think of my career in a music metaphor, right? Like I started in a garage band and then I like did some clubs and then I went to a place where it was kind of like, Ooh, I'm at like this crunchy festival maybe. And then found myself in a place where I was doing arena shows and kind of realized, yeah, I can do it, but I'm not connecting with people as much. Mm -hmm. I'm not connecting with my clients. It's not as collaborative. It's not as back and forth. So just yeah. consciously making sure I'm playing with the people and in the venue that mm -hmm. I want to be in, because again, you know, the, the arenas are real cool. The big corporate world is sure. You can work on like MasterCard or something, but you can't get away with shit there. You have to follow the rules. You can't go yep. off script. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I just like playing an arena. It, it, that's it. <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't right. sell certain merch. You can only play for like 15 or 20 minutes. It's, no, yeah, it's like... but that's, that's exactly the metaphor that I was, you know, reflecting earlier today on, I, again, within the context of this conversation, just being really happy of, you know, finding a place where, I can get freaky with people I love getting freaky with who come knowing shit's going to get freaky and that's what they want. And mm -hmm. I keep saying like the freaky and the disruptive, uh, you know, over the years as well, I think you, you can't be disrupt in branding. You can't be disruptive without having incredible strategic rationale as to why this will not fuck your business over, this will actually do good for your business. So again, over the years, growing both sides of the brain to fulfill that, I have found that the most wild ideas that have come out of my mind have really been over the last few years, you know, really, ensuring that both sides are there to support it yeah well bands are the same i looked at it and i was like re i really see it like bands and brands a band is a brand without the um, r yeah you know <laughs> and you've got these things like you just you you create a construct around what you can put out what kind of message you can put out through that that medium you mm -hmm. know so you know as a solo artist you can do a lot more of what you want when you're working with a band you have a, a band image you have to work within right um and i think layla we talked about like uh you said something earlier allison i was trying to remember what it was but it keyed off um the thing where um i was talking i was thinking about conversations we've had about layla you going out and kind of being the boss of your own like like suddenly you had to uh lead you know um in your own group and kind of um stand up when people were not always you know maybe critical or you know what i'm saying like just um, being able to keep going and find your own voice and find your way to to lead and and um, call the shots, you know, even if everybody's not right there behind you. Um, yeah, you mean more like in the bands where? Yes, right. Yeah, um, you're kind of pulling everybody's weight, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, although that's that was more of a problem earlier on, um, not so much now, but yeah, that that definitely built a foundation for me to, you know, do everything on my own and not have to rely on people that weren't reliable or whatever. Right. Um, but having the freedom, you know, being, you know, when you're a solo artist, it's like you're free, especially when you're a solo artist operating under your name and not like a moniker. Mm -hmm. It's like you, 
you become this entity <laughs> unto yourself that's like this thing that's separate from who you really are, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's freeing, and then and then you you can kind of like bounce around. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I had so much guesswork piling up that. You know, I could just, and I think being a solo artist was what drove that, that, that I could just be my own agent and, you know, do a, do a guest vocal or a guest trumpet part on a song or mm, that's great. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Well, when you guys were talking about uh, like the opposite ways that you kind of, you know, get that message out there and you were saying like, um, you know, you were saying Layla, how it just, uh, it just comes out through these places kind of organically um and and through what you do um and who you are and Allison you were talking about it being the opposite it's very thought out it's very it's very front front end driven and Layla's is very um kind of internally driven and that's how I saw it before I was talking about like um a hidden disruption and a disruption from within um they almost sound like the same type of thing, but a hidden disruption is kind of like that, or like it's, it's, it's just part of you. It's hidden within you. It just comes out. And so you're not going around, I'm going to disrupt things. Whereas in your field, Allison, you do, that's what you say, you know, um, and that disruption from within in the organization can be um, like you were talking about how to change people's minds on, you know, using free range eggs as we were talking about and, and mm -hmm. getting, getting customers at Taco Bell or where, wherever, you know, whatever brand to care about that and be interested. You kind of get into their psyche and meet them where they're at and create that disruption. And it's very specific. So. Yeah. And I will say from deep within me, my brain works in a disruptive way, right? Andy Warhol art is what you can get away with. And to mm -hmm. me, design that design that really pushes culture to new places is what I enjoy doing the most. I don't like decorating things. I like changing things. So I think the way that like the, the Taco Bell example you're bringing up now, which was a CSR platform, so basically, hey, they use cage-free eggs and they have less salt in their time and, and a bunch of really amazing innovations that they were doing as well. Like my brain went immediately to, cool, let's take the good guys and the bad guys, villain and hero mm -hmm. narrative of professional wrestling and smash that with like, what do we need to do to make people cheer on, yay, cage-free eggs, the way that they do wrestling right. again. I'm not going to go into the whole concept <laughs> now because we don't have time, but yeah. this idea of, you know, shifting culture by taking things, projects that are like, whoa, how are people going to give a shit about that? And then finding things that, that are narratives and approaches that they completely understand. And there's no way that they would ever make sense, but then you, From you know, you do the research, you do the backing to it, you give the like, you know, rollout plan of how to do it. So it does make sense. And then it ends up being very disruptive. Who else in the QSR industry would ever get away with thinking about doing a CSR platform that way? That's just like Layla's lyrics with really beautiful ambient vocals and whatnot, and having this really intense message coming through. It's the same idea. Yeah, you know, putting these these things together, and it was interesting when we talk about these different ways that you guys, uh, you know, work these messages through and what you do, and then you came up with that concept of um, white, you know, like being opposite, dark and light. Not necessarily like a, an idea of good and bad, because it's all you know, but just these opposites. And then you're mentioning like spy versus spy, and I it made me go back and think about all of those magazines that I would read, Mad Magazine and Spy, and and, and those those comic strips. And I was thinking about the right and wrong and, and um, you know, that's when I started to think about, um, you know, doing the right thing, you know, like kind of, to me, what you both do is also not just about being authentic and, and for yourselves, but is about doing the right thing, you know, or what is that right thing, but about being, um, making positive, being positive in the world, you know, 
um, not positive in the sense of like everything's bright and shiny and great, but that, um, you know, making choices that are healthier for us or real for us. And I think for myself, a lot of that is about being true to yourself. It isn't about, you know, um, I want to be this bright, shiny, positive thing. It's about being true to myself and, and really looking at what needs to be looked at out there uh, in the world and within ourselves. Um, and to me, a lot of that disruption um, was really about creating awareness, you know, bringing messages out there that bring people's eyes to a topic, to a thing that you want them to look at. You know, and it's just, it's bringing awareness out um, into the world um, and whatever you want that to be, you know? And so I wanted to know in, since we're right up at the edge of our time, um, what are your final thoughts on that? You know, with all the disruption that we've had with COVID and, and everything that has changed and how has that disruption um either shifted your perceptions or of things or, you know, made you really trench in and push forward and in, into what you're doing. Hearing from each of you. I don't really see it as right or wrong or right. healthy and not healthy and positive and negative. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely sending a lot of negative energy out of there, out there for my, I mean, or a lot of people see it as negative, right? It's cathartic, but it's uncomfortable. I like to make people uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there you, I guess you can draw something positive out of that. Absolutely. Um, and then you mentioned COVID that's been the biggest global disruption we've had in our lifetime. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's made some people more creative. It's, it's devastated some people's creativity where they're just numb and they can't get that part of their brain to work anymore. I mean, I don't mean to be a downer, I, you know, but um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, COVID has created a lot of opportunity for some people right. and it's, it's taken away opportunities for a lot of people. And, um, and I, I think it's good to uh, welcome change and adapt. I think it's all about adapting at every stage. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How about you, Allison? Uh, for me, I've, I've always been, and again, since my, my JDK upbringing, I've always been hyper interested in how culture works, how culture is influenced, not by brands, but by people, by music, by events, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think in the span of my career, culture was driven by like, what's the cool thing to do? And now culture is screaming, what is the right thing to do? And I just think it's an exciting new chapter. And I hope we talk 10 years from now and we're like, wow, like, hey, we're all sustainable and we're taking care of each other. Like, what's the, what's the next chapter that, that culture will be screaming for? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that to me is also like, I love that, you know, to your point, Layla, that, yeah, it's not about positive, negative specifically. And this is one of the, the things I love about black and white and the yin yang symbol, which is a huge symbol for me as a martial artist, as well as that um, there's no judgment on any of those, those things. They are, you know, and I, as our, my teacher yeah. would often say, it's like, things aren't good or bad. They are, mm -hmm. they just mm -hmm. are. And uh, you want to exist in that place where you can experience both mm -hmm. and whatever that may be. Um, and I so think that, that's where true learning resides in yeah. the, that neutrality of judgment. Right, right. Because the judgment of one creates a judgment on the other and it, it throws, it, it creates all kinds of, of uh, you know, in, in, uh, misperceptions and misconceptions on things. So um but we're out of time and so um we had a lot of chat going on and i don't have any questions in here so i'm gonna let us wrap it up so we can have a great evening but thank you both for coming and talking about this and um it's a bit of a disruptive topic too and i was trying to figure out like how do we get our heads around it and really just i like to just open it up and go all right here it is let's talk about it more because this is 
we are in a disrupted time where everything is going to keep going in this new direction. And so it's just, it's a, it was something I wanted to really get, start getting my head around a lot more. So thank you very much for, for joining us here. So of course, thank you very much. Thank you. And have a great evening, everybody. If you want to save the chat, um, because there's a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, information in the chat, you can hit the three dots and hit save the chat there. Um, and then um, this will be up on YouTube in a few days. So thank you so much. And everybody have a great evening. All right. Thank All right. you. Take care. Bye-bye.